All right. We are at time and we're officially going to get started. So uh, we are here with Dennis Hammond today, your journey as a landscape photographer. So for those of you that don't know, my name is Chris Woolley. I'm going to be your host tonight uh, for our episode of Let's Develop. Um, and if you don't know what that is, if this is your first time joining, um, we've got a new episode every two weeks where we have professionals from the photography industry that come in and they share information on here. Um, you can register and see the full lineup at acilab.com slash let's dash develop. Um, so uh, you can learn more about what's happening. Um, and a big shout out to American Color Imaging for helping put this webinar series together. So thank you, ACI. Um, and if you stay to the end, we've also got a special offer from them as well as some prizes and goodies and giveaways um, to do. Uh, if you've missed the previous episode with Bob Coates, Zen and the Art of Camera Care, that is live along with the other episodes that we've done on ACI's website. So you can go ahead and check those out. Um, Bob did have some cool specials, deals and discounts uh, for camera gear and other fun stuff that's on his page. So be sure to go and check that one out. So uh, I'm excited, Dennis. Are you excited for today? I am. Been excited for a while. I love sharing. I love sharing. Sherry or sharing or both? Yeah, that too. A little bit of one sharing, one sherry. Yeah. <laughs> Similar. Uh, so uh, we've got a really, really cool episode in store for you guys today. Dennis is going to be sharing information about your journey as a landscape photographer. Uh, and uh, for those of you that don't know Dennis, uh, his accolades are freaking through the roof that's on here. Master of Photographic Craftsman, CPP, fellow in a whole bunch of different affiliates that's there, national award recipient, past president of ASP. I don't even think I can say that all in one breath. Uh, he's from Idaho. That's the only thing that will hold against him. Uh, but that does allow him to get some well, gorgeous it's stuff. Been nice. Pacific it's, been, it's been nice, Chris. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> uh -oh. uh, uh, and uh, you've got degrees in what, biology, geology, and something else or something there too. Uh, and been in the 40, uh, 45 years in the photography industry, doing cool stuff, sharing information. Uh, he's one of the first photographers to get the CPP status, um, set on that committee. He's been on council forever, uh, an affiliate juror. And you've done so much, at least for Washington State, where I'm from, in terms of helping out our organization and being a part of our image competition. Uh, ASP past president, national award uh, award recipient uh, twice. He's just serving this industry. He's given back everywhere, left, right, and center. And uh, he's here to do some cool stuff today. Uh, we're going to be looking at your journey as a landscape photographer. So, uh, Dennis, do you want to share some information with us today? Well, I, I sent you the money. You read off all that stuff. It sounded good. <laughs> no, I, I just love uh, what I do. I mean, if, if anybody follows me on Facebook and different places, I always end up my posts with, I love what I do. And, you know, after 45 years plus, um, I'm still loving what I do every day. So um, as we're going through, guys, uh, if you do have any questions or any comments, anything like that, do put them into chat. I'll be moderating it. Dennis has a ton of information for us. So if it's relevant to what's happening, I might peep in. Um, but at the very end of this program, we will have time for Q&A. Um, so there's a little, uh, it looks like a chat icon with a question mark that's on it. If you click that one, that'll make it a question so that I don't miss it. You can also vote on that question. So if you have that same one, give it an upvote and let me know that that's an important one that we want to get answered. Uh, for instance, Mark has a question. Where in Washington am I from? Spokane. That would have been a great one to go in that question mark tab so that uh, we can answer it. But uh, maybe you got questions related to landscapes and photography or something specifically from Dennis. Uh, that's where we'll want to go. So uh, uh, go ahead and put where you're in, uh, where you're from in the chat um, so that we can kind of monitor that. If you like something Dennis is saying, put it in there too. This is very social, everybody. All right, Dennis, it's all you. Let's take it away. Hey, well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it so much. You know, he telling everybody about me and things, but um, I live about uh, in southeast Idaho. I live about 90 miles from Yellowstone Park. So it's a, you know, it's a terrible place to have to live. Uh, and as you can see on my screen, I'm a big a proponent of Professional Towers America. I've been a member since uh, the early 80s, and I just love what they propose to us. And I'm a believer in organizations. And this is one of the things that I'm really uh, – 
strong about it is, you know, different organizations and then giving back to those organizations. So this is my beautiful wife and myself. This, uh, my wife, you think I got credentials. She's uh, just amazing and got eight, uh, four PPA degrees and uh, keeps me on my toes. And I stole her from Georgia uh, 10 years ago, and uh, I, I still keep her here. So I must be doing something right. So, you know, we love being in the outdoors. We love doing our thing and love going out. And I guess one of the things I love about this is that I found somebody in my life that wants to share the outdoors with me, that enjoys what I do. And so I'm just thankful to have her in my life. And that, that's what I'm trying to say here, too, is if you got somebody in your life, or it doesn't have to be a spouse, or you got some best friend that you can go out with all the time. Because if I wake up and I say, man, we need to leave, and it's 3 in the morning, of course, I get grumps and yumps, and she yells at me. But you know what? She goes out, and we recreate images. So one thing I, I want to bring up is I am a PPA filiger. And, you know, this is one of the things that, we have that we judge images by but this isn't the only thing you use it for for judging this is what i use i use this every day in the back of my head when i'm creating my fine art images my competition shots i'm using every one of these 12 elements so i just uh you know extend to you to go out and memorize these put these out there and use these in your uh, presentation your composition for uh your competition work so the journey of a landscape photographer, and I was telling Chris, I go, yeah, this is the RDV version. And he goes, what's, what's RDV? And I go, it's the Reader's Digest version. Uh, usually when I do <laughs> program, um, I'm doing three to four hours of this. So I'm really going to blast through this. And uh, if you've got a question, I hope I'm not going too fast for you. So as a landscape photographer, we already have a love of nature and the outdoors. But to capture that scene into an RDV image is sometimes a challenge. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been out and people I've been out with, you know, we, we see a scene, it looks wonderful, we get home and it's like, nope, didn't get it. And it, it's really kind of, I, I'm sure nobody here has ever had that problem, but I will admit it's happened to me less and less now than it used to, but I think it's because of practice and going about and doing things. So it's, it's going out and enjoying nature is a big part of it. From experience, we either get filled with, uh, frustrated with the process of all this, or we become more determined to create better images. And I'm really, really hoping that this is where you are, is that you want to become better because that last part I think is important. And we don't want to be failures at uh, what we love to do. You know, Ansel Adams is one of my heroes, and I think I got every book he's ever done. But landscape photography is the supreme test of the photographer and often the supreme disappointment. And boy, how true that is because, you know, we go out, we, go these things and we're beset by the the weather the timing of day and who we are and our equipment what we have and sometimes it works out great and sometimes it really disappoints us so that's one of the things just remember that even if you fail you can go out tomorrow and do it again this is like a family that's going to um you know, not be around. You can still go out and still grab the Tetons or Yellowstone or some uh, mountain that range you love to go see. So work on there. Now, uh, if you know who John Muir is, I've read his autobiography and several of his books. But you know, as you begin your journey, you need the biggest thing about this in photography as a landscape photographer. We need to enjoy the experience. I cannot tell you how many times I've been in a location and I see people. Uh, get up or they walk down the trail they walk up and I was just at one place a couple weeks ago and, and they walked down the trail about a quarter mile they literally took one shot and walked off and you know the light was changing the mist and fog was raising and I'm going like wow how could they just take one shot so um, John Muir was one of a very activist in the com uh, com um, conservatives and you know we want always want to make sure that we uh follow through and experience this in the scene. Okay, I'll just hit this real hard. The use of a tripod uh, is going to create images. Now, my wife doesn't know I shared this one, but somebody posted this, saw this picture of her, and they go, well, damn, she's got her hat turned around. She's getting serious. Well, my wife is serious. She's an amazing photographer. And I, I didn't get the memo about to how dangerous it is on cliffs, but I'm up on cliffs, Moab, taking pictures. But, you know, we – Probably 99% of my photography is taken with a tripod. And 
Using a tripod does a couple of things. And this is so important because it slows you down. Because, you know, you see people come up and they go, chit, 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 and then they walk off. Well, it's in there somewhere. Well, a tripod slows you down. It helps you find your composition. It makes you think about what you're doing. And it allows you to lose short, slower, uh, lower shutter speeds. And it kind of makes you look cool. Because, you know, you're, you're probably the only guy out there with a tripod. So... But then you go out and somebody's got a bigger, better tripod. Then you get tripod in being one, go get another tripod. But um, tripods are so important. And, and uh, if you don't have one, that should be your next investment. So who here uses tripods in their uh, landscape photography? If you do, put it in the comments on there. Yeah. Well, no, don't go out with a monopod. That doesn't do as well as that. But uh, do tripods because you can do a slow shot. But that's one thing I love is my tripods. Ooh, and I use, I use, I use them here. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You know, I use Manfrotto tripods. I've been with Manfrotto for many, many years. And oh, so the other thing I do is I use a ball head. And I don't like the handles and things sticking out. I use a ball head so I can manipulate, move, and uh, move around real quick and change around. So that's what I like. That's my style. And you know, you have to work. I don't like the pistol grips because they drift and some other things. So that's that's probably some of the most important equipment you can purchase for yourself. There, landscape photography is going to increase your understanding of light and exposure, and it's going to uh, benefit your photography immensely. Now, we as photographers, you know, we never could think about lighting and sunrises and sunsets and golden hours. We look at contrasts and shadows and highlights and uh, making your images better. I will bet every one of us out there, we're driving along. Oh, look at that beautiful light on the hill. Look at that beautiful light there. Oh man. And I'm, 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 I have stopped, had people say, Oh, let's just keep driving. I stop and then I get the shot and they go, Oh, that's pretty cool. Can I have a copy of it? So <laughs> you know, we really, as photographers, it really uh, starts having us look at how we look at lighting about us and what happens there. So that's one thing that we really need to be conscious of how things look around with the light, the shadows, and things go from there. So, you know, we look at landscape photography, and it captures the essence of nature, but also can focus uh, focus on man-made features as well. And, you know, actually I was commissioned by some banks to get some local facilities, but this ended up being a 40 inch canvas uh, in a bank for uh, a local area. But it was, you know, just a local piece. I mean, let it go you know, in PPA competition, probably not, but you no, know, I'll take those green merits any day for those kind of things. <laughs> Dollar bills. Yep. Oh, you bet. Those grants from Franklin's make me happy. <laughs> oh. The best ones. Yes, they are. So a uh, fine art la uh, landscape uh, generally uh, captures the essence of nature. But like I say, it can capture you know, the, the man-made we talked about and um, you know the, the a scene in Italy that I captured. You know, this is one that I, really, I like. I was up in the Tetons. It was a stormy morning, and I was photographing the Tetons. And this guy interrupted my shot. I go, well, I kind of like it. So it, it's just one of those shots because you got a little bit of the Tetons hanging in there. And uh, just man-made things in there. Was there a comment there? Oh, okay. No, no, just the peanut gallery here. Oh, okay. Well, as landscape photographers, here's the thing is we bear witness what we've seen. We choose our subject to photograph and how we photograph them and how we photograph them says what we believe and think. And what people don't understand is that we bring the essence of our photographs every song and record we've heard, every art piece and photograph we've heard, you know, people in conversations, we bring the whole essence of those to our photographs, we, whether we know it or not. So our ability to photograph is the world made visible through the soul of our camera. You know, you can believe all this stuff here and if whatever you want there, but I believe that our cameras have souls and we interject our lives and feelings into that. And that's so important for us to not just be, have it just be a tool, but part of our lives. You know, a lot of times, you know, the most common reason to photograph a landscape is to remember a personal observation while we're out of doors and traveling. And, you know, that is fine. But with that being said, if you're just doing casual landscape shooting of where you've been, please don't enter that in competition. Tell me that you're doing fine art work when you're doing travel pictures because uh, that ain't going to fly usually. So not the snapshots? Uh, no, I, there's no category for snapshots. 
Do you and, still um, take those for personal enjoyment or is everything you do fine art? You know, I still do. And, you know, it's interesting when you ask that. I still take them, but then I'm still interjecting that thing. Well, let me move this angle. Let me move over here. Let me get. And it's like, man, I'm never pleased. But yes, I still have some, but I'm finding myself more and more trying to always create something that's fine art. So, you know, photographing, you know, thing, we talked about the tripods and things, but technical competence is not just enough. Everybody thinks, oh, I know all my camera, I know my f-stops, I know my shutter speeds. Well, that's wonderful. But uh, we need to depend on a couple of things. TLC, now it's not like the tender loving care that y'all think it is, but, you know, first of all, it's, it's timing. We, is, as photographers, we talk about the timing of our photographs. Okay, here's the important thing, I think getting your butt out of bed and getting to the location on time and they'll study the area and the weather and most importantly that decisive moment to click that shutter you know you're out there and you're photographing it and you can okay when's the right time so you know you, you can take a series now you have to remember with digital now we have a little bit more latitude about how much we can photograph things back when i first started every time you click that shutter it was a buck you know to get a proof and negatives and proof and you had to think twice about how much shooting you got. Now, you know, I hear people say, oh, I shot 10,000 images on this trip. I'm going, holy smoly, I don't want to have to edit all them. So but the timing thing is, is get your butt out of bed. And people who've been on my workshops and things, if I say wheels down at 0530, 0531, we're down and you walk out late, we're done. You're gone. So in the so, chat, if you don't mind getting up early to get the shots, put there. If you do, if you absolutely hate it and would rather rate for uh, sunset, uh, put that one in the chat. I'm curious what our audience thinks here. You know, somebody actually, I took some people out a while back and they never really done much sunrises because they hated getting up. And they turned to me and he goes, wow, it does this twice a day with the lighting and things. So it's just, um, Sunrises are just different. You know, a lot of people, oh, don't you get tired in the middle of the day? And I had an old landscape photographer years and years ago. He goes, that's why God made cottonwood trees, so we can take a nap about 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the audience seems to be thinking that uh, sunrise is the time to go. Yeah, awesome. Oh, right. We got a great, great crowd there today. You know, yeah, it's not easy getting up at 3, 2, 3, 4 in the morning, get out and do those things. But it's worth it. Oh, Yeah. You forget about all that when you get that lone image on your back of your camera. Right. <laughs> so, and we can go into that more, but the lighting part. Okay, so with TL, they'll go to lighting. We become addicted to finding the good light. To us, that is light that's different than we see every day. You know, the clouds and the lights and the reflects off clouds. And then we're looking for the different qualities of light. You know, the back line, the side lighting, the soft lighting from the cloud covers. We're looking for that. We become addicted to that. And um, everybody sees it differently. Uh, so, you know, if you're in a group of six photographers or five or six there, everybody's going to see things differently. So you have to do your own thing. But uh, we just need to look uh, and find that different quality of light. And that's what really makes the image better, in my humble opinion. So... And then the last thing is composition. Now, this could be a, a two-week course on composition. But, you know, the composition, you know, it just makes a difference between a boring image and one that captures the viewer's heart and eye. And part of the big part of composition we talked about a second ago was uh, using a tripod. Because you set the tripod up, and it's amazing when you set it up, you start looking for your viewfinder, you start seeing the composition is different. Now, here's the thing is, I'm 6'5", my wife's five three, four. Oh, she's in the back room. Four. Oh, man, I'm in <laughs> trouble. Get that one right, Dennis. <laughs> you, oh, man, I'm, I'm in trouble. Actually, you know, because it's interesting, without height difference, we actually get different compositions. We see things differently and things uh, just look different. And so a lot of times we can be five feet away apart and we get totally different looks. But because we're shooting on tripods, we can duplicate the shot and the angles and going from there. Now, with I know I didn't put it in here, but I will tell you right now, one of my favorite lenses for landscape photography is my 7200. I love my 7200 because I love how it compresses 
the image. I love how it just makes things feel. And I know I use the 24105 a lot as well, but I also do a lot of pan stitches with my uh, 7200 and put them together. But that's just my style, and that's how I like doing things. Other people like other lenses. And I have other programs, and I've done a whole series of shots with all the different lenses and show the same series and how it makes things look so differently. But uh, that makes all the difference in the composition. So we need to, when we're composing, we need to look for leading lines. And, you know, everybody talks about, oh, it doesn't fit the rule of thirds. We need to look beyond the rule of thirds. There are so many rules, be, and I call them suggestions. Everybody goes, oh, they're hard, fast rules. Well, they, that's what they call the rules, but I think they're more suggestions. But there are so many more uh, ideas and uh, suggestions on composition out there besides that that we need to address. Uh, you know, take time to compose and think and help reduce those boring shots. I know as a, a judge, a lot of times I'm looking at images and, you know, I think, man, this shot could have been so much more stellar uh, if they would have just composed this way, said this. And, it, you know, it's just really hard, you know, to uh, look at images when they're boring like this. So I just uh, impress on you that study composition. And I actually have a lot of art books and uh, not photography books, but art books on composition. And it's really fun to study and read about them. So as we go through, you know, we look at lines and we just mm -hmm. talked about lead, leading lines. Yeah, this is one of my lone images from last year uh, called the Stair Steps of Time in Yellowstone. That's and beautiful. It's, um, thank you. And so it's got all the leading lines up to the mountains, the clouds. And uh, then, uh, like I said, Ansel Adams, if you can't see my influence, Ansel Adams, I just love how the river is leading in the rocks and the juxtaposition of the little rocks and then the trees in the background. So I just love that kind of feel. And just, again, the leading lines, but they're all rocks with water, you know, circumventing around them. And this is little things. I shoot this kind of thing. It's like, this is the kind of stuff that go to dentist's office or doctor's office for peace and calming. So that's the kind of things I really try to look for a lot of times. Um, and then as artists, we just need to develop an infallible technique. Then put yourself at the mercy of inspiration, meaning that we need to have a system, a way, and uh, everybody, they kind of bounce over a place. They, Here's the thing. They go to one workshop, they do that, and then next week they all want to do that workshop style. Then they go to another workshop, then they try to change all their style. Then they go, they read another book, and they change. So you just need to figure out what you want to do for yourself, practice it, and and really work that for, your, for yourself. Now, we can learn from other photographers, like tonight you're here, I and mean, you can read other photographers' articles and see work and uh but you need to develop your own style and technique. You can learn, improve, and then adapt. And like I said, study, adapt, and innovate your own style. And you know, there's sometimes, you know, when I'm looking at images, I go, well, I can tell you what workshop they went to last week or vice versa, what series of books they started reading. And uh, so just learn to adapt uh, and to you, how you feel and how you look at things. You know, frequently, you know, photographers, we fail to convey the emotional impact of the image. We see a beautiful scene, and then we stop the car or hike along, we plan a trip, and then it inspires to create the image initially. And then we uh, sometimes they just don't come out that way. So we need to stay the images that we're working on and ponder why they move us. And if they don't work, you know, keep notes and figure out how it's going to make it work better for you the next time. So re regardless of how wonderful your work is, it's going to be a fail if it doesn't elicit a response and a visual response. Uh, you know, you hear sometimes in judging, you see an image comes up and you hear the judges go, ooh. And they're not supposed to make an audible response, but it just kind of pops out. And uh, because they just see this beautiful image. And so then uh, that kind of affects how you feel about it uh, right then and there. But, you know, so it, Capturing the response and how you feel about an image. You know, this is one I did in uh, Yellowstone. This is actually on film several years ago. Uh, so if people say, oh, you made that Photoshop. Nope. I just had a red pull of purple uh, coking filter in front of it. And that's one shot, nothing stacked. And that is um, what I captured there. Because I saw that scene and I immediately I knew what I wanted to do. Um, for example, I was in Italy and I got up a 
in the oh dark 30 walked up around the hill is in raining and got there just as the storm is breaking up and this was a three pan stitch because i had to pre-visualize what i wanted this to be and what i wanted to do uh, again you know, driving along and i saw this image um, and i had to stop and capture it and i will admit the only thing i did if you can see that i took out a, a, a metal fence post that was in the picture so it'd be more pristine but it was interesting some of the judges when it came to competition um thought to, i desaturated the snow and things and i'm going no you don't understand when clouds come into the high country this is what it looks like and low there and this went lone and is actually hanging in my house i just think this is a beautiful scene and uh, that's it's called change of seasons uh with the image and so i just love you know capture and find those kind of scenes that are different than no everybody else is getting and then there again uh i've driven past this scene several times and this particular day um i was actually with my family and my grandson and we i was kind of talking about photography and then all of a sudden this little geyser in the background started going off and the steam was rising up i go okay here's a different look with the kind of encroachment of the steam and killing that little tree and everything going on. So uh, to me, it had a, a big visual response on that. And this is one uh, area I love to go to. Uh, it's called the Wedding Tree in the Tetons. And unfortunately, just a couple of weeks ago, Sherry and I are up there and lightning had hit this tree right here and broke it off. So now we have the, but now we document this tree, we've captured um with without being broken off but you, it frames the tree up nice with the view of the valley and going on from there and you know i was uh, photographing a scene i was in indiana teaching at uh, winona and i turned around from a scene in the early morning and there's this shot was coming through and i was able to grab it and it's called fallen comrade but uh, i just the instant i saw this scene uh, i turned my camera what i do quite frequently to help me understand what my thought process was, I just turned my to black and white on the back of my cameras. I shoot raw and JPEG. My JPEG came out black and white. And that way, when I come back, I knew what I wanted to do because if I'm editing a couple weeks later, I come back, okay, why is that? Oh, now I know why that's black and white. I'm, that was my vision. So a lot of times when I'm shooting, I would just com convert the first shot into black and white so I can just keep reminding myself what that image, my vision was at that very second. And uh, another image, you know, I just love the lines and the design of this that uh, it did one competition, but just a carved, it's carved by weather and uh, stone, um, weather and water. And so it's just one of those scenes that most people wouldn't take, but I just love the graphic feel of a lot of these images. So many image makers use their photographs to validate their experience. What well, should be the other way around that the experiences should validate their visionary images? Like some of those I just showed you and I told you some of the experiences there. You know, I in the it was taken one of my Colorado workshops and we were out photographing and the morning sky and things going in the background. Um, this is one I did a couple of years ago that did very well in competition, but I was teaching a workshop in Yosemite for California photographers and I had seen it and I went back and got it and it, it has a very ori an oriental feel to it. And the second I did this, I knew I had to do it in black and white. And it's interesting, again, judges didn't understand why all this misty feel was up here. They didn't understand the water was just spraying. And, um, it was just an overcast, rainy rain. I, I was in pouring rain when I did this. So this is one of those shots that I feel has a very emotional feel to the image as well. And I have a, a metal print of this hanging in my house. Oh, by ACI. And <laughs> so I love this image. How are we doing, Chris? Any questions? Uh, we do. Yep. Yeah, but they're uh, ones that are more about the process. So we'll, we'll get to them at the end. Okay. Great. Another waterfall, and this is Yellowstone. Um, this was Moose Moose Falls. And unfortunately, there's places you can't get to this anymore because people have come in and destroyed some of the trails and things. So now they've got it blocked off because of people being inconsiderate to nature and what's going on. And But again, when I photographed this several years ago, um, I knew immediately it's going to have to be black or white. So... Uh, if you can't tell, a lot of my work is black and white. I love what I do. Uh, many years, all my, my whole cases have been black and white. And uh, 
And you, this is a lot of the presentation. I love the fine art, just uh, one simple line, mat around there, and that's generally how I enter them, just like that. Uh, very simple. Um, again, another storm catching the emotion in Yellowstone with the storm breaking and across the valley there, uh, the, all the steam pots, the fog. And I love going up when it's cold and misty and uh, the inclement weather because it just shows a whole different uh, ambience. I mean, most, most tourists, when they travel, they see the scene between 10 uh, and 4 to 5 in the daytime. That's what they see. And that's I, I did a program for PPA. I call it more than a postcard because – I understand that people travel and that's when they see the scene, but this is stuff that people don't see and it, and it generates emotion and feeling in it. Okay, one of the, the biggest challenges we have as landscape artists is to go beyond the documentation of the scene and to try and, uh, and to communicate on a visionary level. And, you know, this is a scene I just did uh, a year ago up in uh, Prismatic Springs and uh, Actually, we hiked up there once in the morning, and it's a mile and a quarter hike one way or a mile and a half one way, and I didn't like it, so I hiked back up there that afternoon. I did another hike up, and people laughed at me because I had a monopod. I hiked up to the overlook on this. It used to be you had to scramble for trees and bushes. Now they got this beautiful grandma could go on. Nope, you're cutting out a bit, Dennis. Nope, I can't. We can't hear you at all. Can you try unplugging and replugging back in headset? Oh, nope. Oh, there we go. I think I can hear you now. Okay, can you hear me now? There we are. Yep, we're back in. Verizon commercial. Yeah, right. So I, so I saw the graphics of this piece, and uh, I mean, I got on top of the rail. I had my monopod, and I was pushing up so I could get up another six, eight feet, try to get this visionary. But I just love the graphics, the feel of this image. Um, I wish we could fly over and shoot it and photograph it, but you know, you have to do with what you can. And, and but this to me captures the whole essence of the shot of that pristine area. Uh, we do have one question that's related uh, from Frank. Wants to know, what do you mean by communicating with a visionary level? Can you expand on that? So that's what I talked to visionary. Yes, I mean, so many people look at an image and they just feel it's an image. But for me, a visionary level means that you had a vision, you interpret what you're going to be. It maybe it's preconceived, maybe. And what a lot of people say, oh, I only go if I understand what I'm going to do. But a lot of times images pop up as you're going along and go, oh, that's there. But visionary level to me is when you create that image that sustains that artistic piece that you're looking for. And I hope that, um, you know, fills out what you're looking at. But, you know, we, we are visual artists and we try to find things that really stir people's hearts and their thoughts. I really hope, Frank, that helps out there. Let me just say here. Got to stay hydrated. And that is water. By the <laughs> you know, here's another, you know, most people walk past these scenes, just all the, just the holdouts of the leaves on the trees. Um, one is the Pacific Northwest, or no, this is in the East Coast, and find some of these trees and leaves just to hold out there. And this is one that did well in competition. And uh, I got a hall pass with another friend and went up to Yellowstone, and I went to this area I haven't been to for a while, but um, it was misty and foggy. We drove up there. We couldn't see the road. It was so foggy. And I have to tell you, I walked down to the lake, and my friend walked the other direction. And as soon as I took this image, um, I knew, I looked at the back of the camera, I'm not trying to be pretentious, but I go, well, there's my next loan print. And well, I was hoping it would be. And so the only thing I did is took out a couple of uh, wild plants that were just kind of floating there and distracting. But that is exactly how um, I saw it. And a lot of people say, oh, you painted this. Or people actually say, did Sherry paint this? No, my wife would not paint something for me for competition. But that is the image that, as we saw it. So to me, that become a, a, one of those visionary pieces that really come forth. And then as striking as soft as this one is, this is just as harsh, uh, capturing the image and you know the landscape and what it can do and in the background with just this solo tree that all the um, calcium and the has overtaken this little tree. And you know, finding little scenes like we were on a 
uh, cruise ship teaching uh, photography group. And we just saw, I saw this image as we were leaving port and so I had to run up a couple of steps to, uh, I mean, floors to get this hot so the boat wouldn't be in the horizon. But it was just simplicity. It, that's all it shows is just the simplicity of the image. And as well, this, I mean, some people have seen this before. This was uh, kind of uh, one of my thesis pictures for ASP, but this was just, I went out to Utah Lake in the early morning and it was just kind of boring in a way. And I was uh, photographing and then the clouds and the storm rolled in and it was really kind of interesting how the storm just kind of hit the clouds, the background. But here's the key thing. I was shooting over on this area here and I didn't have the impact compositionally. And then I just moved over a little bit, got this stump in that lower uh, left, and then it just creates this little juxtaposition. So your eye goes from the stump back to the mountain and back and forth and it creates this nice juxtaposition and makes your eye flow back and forth there. Because if you just sit back and put your thumb over that stump, it doesn't quite have the same impact that it does with that in there. So this is one thing that we get asked a lot, you know, people call us up because we're so close to 90 miles from Tetons, 90 miles from Yellowstone and, and some of the iconic places in Utah. But people say, um, where's all this out? I want to go photograph the barns. I want to go photograph this. You know, it's nice to have those art pieces in your portfolio, like, you know, Swanbacher's Landing. Everybody wants to go photograph this. It's a beautiful place. Um, you know, just like the barns, let's go photograph the barns. We went there that day. There was, you couldn't see the Tetons. So, and some of the people I was with were upset because they couldn't see the Tetons. I go, well, you got to just adapt. And so I just photographed it and cropped out the mountains and just got the steam, the clouds and uh, created a totally different kind of image and feel. And um, it just, those, Im those iconic images are nice, but then you start going in and you find other scenes and images when you're going through and you see as you're walking through parks and um, you, you see different images that um, as you walk along the riverbanks and you know then staying out late and capturing uh, the Milky Way and doing things like that you know, it's, it's all these little things that are so different and you know it, always have your camera if I put it if I said one other thing is um, I very rarely go anywhere without my camera. Like, okay, Walmart, Kmart, whatever. That's not there, but on any trips or drives or anything, it's in the back of my camera, a bag, uh, back of my car. And because of that, I was able to capture this shot. Uh, we were driving back from Salt Lake and come over a hill, and there it was. And um, so I say, so here's the problem like with Sherry and I, both of us want to see things. We have to yell dibs, see who gets the shot. So, uh, if we see a shot, dibs, 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 and it's kind of fun. So, you know, this is another one. As I was driving in back, we were back in the south, and we, I just love these old uh, trees, and I love the lines of the roads going in there in that little light spot in the very far back um, that just kind of leads your eye right into it. So, you know, I look for things different than what everybody else is doing. Now, the other thing is, as I look at as a photographer, is find out when nature is going to offer something different and make plans to photograph it. Uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, eclipse was uh, really close to us. We had 100% totality here. So, you know, when NASA and Geographic sets up 20 miles from your house, I think we're in a pretty good spot. So we went there, staked out a place, and we photographed the eclipse. And we got some images that were remarkable there. You know, the eclipse coming across. Uh, the super moons when they come through. This is from the Idaho side. And uh, interesting enough, you know, uh, I entered this in a, a regional competition, and one of the judges uh, says, well, the moon can't be that big. That's been dropped in, and it's like, man, you haven't been out here in the West when the moon's coming up in a super moon like that. But that is really true how it is, and uh, it, it gets a little frustrating to me when I have um, people who don't know some of the nature's facts, but... Um, so we watch weather and we make time to photograph it. You know, I see I one morning we got up and we drove to Jackson and it was by 20 below zero. And uh, I stopped and I knew what was going to see along this area. And I was anticipating this and I found exactly what the fog and the mist and just uh, coming through there. You know, one day I saw a storm uh, coming up on the foothills from us and I come in to share. I go quick. We got to get our gear and head up there. And we got this shot again. I had the old dibs. 
But this shot is called uh, Man Harnessing Nature. And it was actually kind of scary. The lightning and the storm was so close. So the lightning's um, getting close by. Put it this way. I'm the I'm 6'5", and I'm out there on a the hillside with a metal tripod. So, you know, I, I'm not. I'm just probably a lightning rod for everything going on out there, but it's worth the risk. It's it's just a lot of fun to go out and do these and have a companion that wants to go out with me and do these. You know, uh, some of the people in, on here may be on my uh, Yosemite workshop, and it was so interesting. We were out doing this one morning, and it's rainy and misty, and the clouds were there, and it wasn't anybody in my group, and the other photographers were sitting there, and they go, we wish that it was all clear and these clouds weren't here i about threw them off a cliff i mean we live and die for the we live and die for this ambient kind of feel but i wish it was clear and not so cloudy well okay so anyway so that this is one of those beautiful shots i just love you know the ambience the clouds the mist and fog and another storm shot coming through and this is one of the ones where sherry i was out there and when you get a text and she asked me if my insurance is paid up and then okay then you better come get in the car because it's getting way way close you know the storms so we just follow things and uh, i i don't know whether she's joking or she's serious when she talks about that but some days you wonder so um here's the other thing is that we look for detailed images um you know, when light isn't right or we're in the middle of the day, people say, what do you do in the middle of the day? Well, we uh, go out, we we are traveling around, we scope out areas, we're uh, scouting for where we want to shoot. A lot, of, okay, that's after the morning nap. But <laughs> we, then we go, <laughs> uh, and by the way, I don't get a morning nap all the time. I'm just joking with that. But um, so, you know, like I just, a bad plan. well, it isn't a bad plan if you can get away with it. But, you know, just finding, just leaves, you know, in little things, finding things in the middle of the day. We're driving along, it was an overcast day, and just I just love this tone and texture of these ferns with the juxtaposition, this big stellar tree coming into the image. Um, this is actually taken the day of the eclipse, and the lighting was getting just weird. I've never seen lighting like that, the total eclipse, and then it just went dark. So I just did this high-key exposure uh, of just these cattails. And it just a graphic, graphic piece. And then I'm actually working on a, a series called Weed Art. And I just found these old milkweeds, the pods, and, and you know, just working on things differently. And one thing we do, I mean, we don't have it here, but a lot of times in my camera bag, I carry a three by three black cloth that I can use for a background, for a reflector, for a diffuser. So I, I carry a black cloth with me, or I tell Sherry to turn around so I can use her back as a background. So there is advantage of having a spouse with you, right? <laughs> um, is this Sherry in the background on that one? Uh, no, no, this is just this out of focus weeds. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> no, but she has a lot of my shots. Um, so, you know, I thought one day I was out, we were out uh, tracking some owls and we'd seen them a couple of times, but they didn't show up. They didn't get the memo about showing up for us. But the wind is blowing and I said, well, I wonder what it looked like. We had these, these foxtails. So I said, well, if you get the blurry action with water, why can't I do it with weeds and grass and things like that? So I just put my, my neutral density filter on and got shot. And I just really enjoy this soft feel of the uh, grass blowing and yeah, that was shot on a tripod and just got the exposure a couple of different times to get the different field of weeds and grass. So I'm always experimenting and trying different things all the time. So we got any questions we need to address real quick? I know we're running out of time. Uh, we are coming up towards the end. If you do have questions, put them in the chat. Um, and here in the next couple of minutes, we'll we'll switch over to the, the Q&A section. Of okay. This. Um, so just tell me, Chris. Just tell me, Chris. I'll I'm hurrying. I'm track. We do All have right. a comment from uh, Stu. You got a new nickname, Lightning Rod Hammond. <laughs> uh, I'll take that. Um, create depth in your landscape with layers, depth of field, and those you know, strong points of interest. So, you no, know, creating depth with the images, the trees, the colors. Well, sorry, back. And then, you no know, depth with all the mountains, the fog, and the mist. And so, you know, we're creating depth and feel with the images there. And then the depth with image proportion with the trees and the Tetons and things in the background. So, we're creating depth and feel. You know the layered look of the with the trail and uh, the roads in the sky. Um, this was taken early morning and it was and I actually know it was 20 below zero. I stepped out the car and got the shot. A lot of times we don't stay outside very long when this happens, but it was nippy. Again, another shot depth 
with the clouds and the feeling and going on. So I you know, love showing the depth and proportion there and seeing how we create depth with everything. You know, more depth with the images, with uh, clouds and the mountains and the little mesas there, how uh, they really show depth and proportion there. I, I seem to have a little a theme going on here. I have a lot of cloud shots, but I just seem to say I uh, love that. We want to create a human element in our images. You know, we have I mean, we have you know little straw bales and you know, an old tractor in the background. This is one of my favorite shots we did in one of our workshops. There's no fence that was leading up into the the quicken ass. And another shot down the river in the falls. We're on about a mile from here, but the storm was rolling in, and Sherry called and told me, "Let's get it, get over there." A fun shot with one with a, I got in Germany with uh, just a little one of the little buggies going through the steam uh, in the morning fog. So the other thing we really look for is simplicity. I think photographers put too much in their images. Well, that's how they saw it. And that's how they want to be. Well, let's maybe take some of that out. And um, we want to be able to find simplicity. This was actually vined outside my house. I walked out one morning and there it was. That's not Photoshop. That is strictly um, the vines going up. And people say, oh, you Photoshopped it. No. Um, I have, we talk about my biology, I was a lichenologist and, and I was doing some research on lichens and uh, this was some image, I just love the designs and tones and textures of these lichens. And finding just a simple leaf and putting um, a friend's purse back behind it for a background because of the contrasting color and finding a, de a design in a log. And the, yes, the leaf was there, it was a different direction. I just turned it around and adjusted it. Is that legal? You know, take it what it was. But uh, my friends were there laughing at me. They tell me they didn't see it, but they didn't think it was funny until it merited. <laughs> and you know, finding any other shots, you know, uh, I was photographing the lake at Jackson and I turned around, this was sitting in the bushes. And uh, I just love uh, th this image as well. And there again, my Ansel Adams field comes out as well as does that when you see the lines and texture and the tones. And then I'm just kind of finish up here with, you know, the design that we look for designs and finding the textures and lines and textures in the, in the nature. And, you know, the fresh snow on the mountains, and, you know, stopping uh, and just looking down. People look down, look behind you, but this will walk on trail and just a bunch of mud that had in a trail that had curled up and dried out and just creating this beautiful, really graphic piece. And then finding some more image, imagery in some um, the prismatic springs up in Yellowstone and creating stuff like this. So I'm going to just tell you, warning, warning, warning. I found like Will Smith, the little, the little robot, you know, you know, pursuing this genre, it's going to do a couple of things. First of all, you're going to be in a better place in the aspect of your work. It's going to push you. You're going to appreciate nature more and want to share and you're going to find that your stress is reduced because you're out there enjoying nature. And it, I just find when I get out there, it's like, ah, okay, I'm done. I don't want to go home now. <laughs> now warning. Though. Yeah. Yeah. But warning, you're probably gonna lose a few friends because you're now that crazy guy or person who drives in the middle of the night to get to that sunrise or you stay out late for that sunset. Uh, or you miss dinner because, Oh, wait a minute. Sunset's coming. And that golden hour is coming. And you're going to be come back with great memories and images to make them jealous. So, you know, that's warning, warning. So, okay, throw the questions at me, but right. make them easy. Make them, make them easy, though. Right, we've got some <laughs> questions. And uh, first one up, what filters do you use? This one's from Paul. Well, I uh, I have a polarizing filter for some things, but, you know, anymore with, uh, besides pan stitch, a lot of things, do not pan stitch with any uh, neutral density filters or polarized filters. It will screw things up. So the morning filter I use a lot of times is my uh, variable neutral density filter, especially for water and wavy shots and things like that. And everything I'm doing now, I'm going to be honest, has been post-production, and I use Nick with uh, color effects for it to get to that. Okay. And then Stu wants to know, what method of converting a color image to black and white? What's your method? Uh, again, Nick Silver Effects. This is one of my favorite. I used to be on the Nick team, and that I've been on, stayed there, and I think it's one of the premium products out there. But again, it's find what works for you, and there's other ones out there, but that's one I like. That's what works for me, and so that's what I stay with. Cool. And then last question that we have right here, what constitutes the designation of fine art photography? 
Uh, they've seen many photographers that call their work fine art, but it doesn't compare to the other works I've seen that are not labeled as fine art. That's a question from Michael. Well, you know, everybody can call it is what it is. Um, fine. You know, everybody's, everybody goes, find out photography by Susie or find out photography by Chris. But, you know, just because you call it that don't mean it is. I think fine art is one of those things that is going to pass the, uh, a couple of tests for me. It's going to be passing the test. Will last the test of time. Is it marketable? Is it sellable? And, you know, is it something that uh, that people are going to have be emotionally moved by? Just because you say it is don't mean it is so. So, you know, it's fine art. It's, you know, that's really one of those subjects that can go on for hours I can talk about. <laughs> but, if it, but if it passes that longevity test, that's a big thing for me. Okay. We do have a couple more questions that came in uh, from Jamie. Is that 70 to 200 you're using, a 2.8, or is it the F4? Yes. Uh, I have this uh, 2.8. Sherry has the F4 because um, the size for her. But, you no, know, it works for both of us. And, but I'm still shooting at... For my pan stitches, eight and eleven, uh, probably on there, and that's why I'm on a tripod. So that way I can get my shutter speed down and get down low enough. And then you just have to adapt with the weather, if the wind trees are blowing or whatever. But, um, but yeah, that works for me. So either's okay then. Okay, uh, from Jillian, uh, what was the name of the filter? I think they were talking about your ND filter. Uh, it's just a variable ND ten stop neutral density filter. Var variable neutral density filter. Okay. Uh, and, also, and don't buy and don't, okay. Just saying, don't buy the cheap ones. Mine's about two hundred fifty dollars because you start getting cheap ones. Oh, there's one for twenty nine dollars. Well, yeah, it's gonna make things kind of off color. It's gonna put some vignettes on the corners and things. So spend the extra money and it'll last for a while. I like to get them with uh, step down rings too, so you can use them on other lenses. Yeah, I got some step down ring for me. Sherry seventy two hundred f four um, is a different size, but we got a different one. See, then here's a caveat: there's two of us shooting, so I have to buy two of everything. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, got another question from Jillian. Uh, do you use layers to enhance your images? I do, and uh, that's a whole other like a whole other class class. You guys we keep need asking. An eight hour version for you. Yeah, yeah, I do. And uh, so I do use layers and um, blend things in differently. And um, I, but you know, honestly, when I work on an image, um, 20, 30 minutes on an image is about all I work on for comp or for a client. Wow. Uh, do you use an incident meter? And this is from Howard. I use both. I, uh, well, I have my in camera meter, which is a reflective meter. And then I do have my handheld meter, which is instant. And then it also converts to a uh, spot meter. So if I have questions about things, I'll meter two or three different ways to ascertain where I need to go with my exposures. Okay. Um, and from Jamie, do you have a brand name on that uh, uh, ND filter that you recommend? Uh, Tiffin is a good one to go by. I mean, I like Tiffin. There's a lot of ones out there. So, uh, I'd like to say start, stay away from the, the cheaper versions of things, but that's where I would go. Okay. And then from Joanne, uh, what camera are you using? Um, I'm still using the 5D Mark III. 5D you know, Mark I'm not III. one of those, I'm one of those guys that just because everybody's got all these new fangled cameras out there doesn't mean they're going to be the best. And you know what? It's still working great for me. And you know what? It's paid for. <laughs> right? That's amazing. And definitely uh, a, a huge thing. It allows you to go on more trips if you don't have to buy more gear, huh? Yep. Okay. So I've got some uh, prizes and stuff to give away. So uh, uh, this is coming up from uh, ACI. So thank you for um, our prizes. And they do have a uh, special that's out there. And this is just for people that are watching it live. Um, you can get 25% uh, off uh, the Ravelli albums. Uh, you do have to use the code that's now in your chat. Um, so if you look on there, a little present looking thing, it's got a special code. I'm also emailing it to you too. If you've registered for this webinar, so you can get 25% off, which is amazing. Uh, and uh, thank you, ACI, for, uh, for doing that special that's on there. So make sure that you pay attention to that one. Um, and just a heads up too of our upcoming lineup. Uh, we've got some awesome things coming up. Up next is going to be Ella Carlson on creativity. Uh, we've got Brian Welsh on the in, on, or on, in, and through. So marketing sales and giving back. I'm going to be doing a special one on price lists and how to price your work. Uh, Erica Lane Harvey. Uh, we got Shannon Squires, Tony Harriman. Lots of cool stuff coming up. I'm also going to put on that side part um, link so that you can register for these as well. They just went live for registration today. Um, so be sure that you're 
checking those ones out. Um, and now we can get to our uh, prize giveaway, which is kind of fun. So um, up first, uh, we've got uh, an ACI Rocks mug. And uh, now I get to bring up the, the fun screen so that uh, uh, we can do our prizes. I got to get here so I can actually interact with it. Isn't this fun? Uh, so let's see who our mug winner is. Spin, 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 spin. And it is John Powers that won the mug. Uh, John, make sure that you reach out so we can get your address uh, so that we can get that uh, mug to you. Um, up next, we've got an ACI t-shirt. Um, so the winner of the t-shirt is... I love the little wheel. <laughs> so much fun. And it's right on the line. It's Tim. Congratulations, Tim. Um, I will need you to reach out to me, too, so I can get your address and T-shirt size, because uh, that one's important. Uh, we want to know there. And now our grand prize. We've got a Ravelli album. Uh, these things are amazing. This is the high-end album that I sell in my studio. Um, absolutely love them. They're nothing but quality. Uh, so really, really nice on there. So uh, let's see who's winning our album. I love Ravelli albums. They are right. so nice. Oh, they... I like the thick pages. I get them with the thick pages and the yep. uh, the leather cover that's on there. Ooh. And we've got Maria. Awesome. That's a long name. I got to write it down. Uh, please reach out to me so I can make sure that you get that so that you can get uh, um, your album that's coming through. Um, so uh, we are just about at the end of our program. Um, so do want to say, if you do have any ideas for speakers that you'd love to see, content that you want covered, things that are going to be helpful for you, please reach out to me. Um, hello at cwoolly.com. And I will track down amazing photographers in our industry so that we can all connect and learn and grow from each other. So uh, uh, email address is on there. Or if you're getting emails, just hit reply on there so that uh, we can all talk together. Whew. Okay, <laughs> that was quite the uh, <laughs> the lineup that we have here, and uh, we got all sorts of fans from the crowd. So, uh, curious on the chat, what was your favorite thing that you learned today from Dennis? Uh, what new tidbit did you learn, or things that you want to start uh, implementing on here? So, if you do have something, please put that in the chat right now. I know Dennis wants to go over them, and I want to go over them too. So, uh, we can start learning. Um, and if you do happen to be in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in October, Dennis is doing for the right there. Photographers of Washington um, up in Leavenworth, Washington, doing a full day workshop, including shooting, uh, which I think is going to be absolutely uh, amazing on there. So so check that one out. Yeah, I just uh, posted real quick. You know, October, we're uh, into September for October. We're doing our, our, our workshop in Colorado, then your workshop with Leavenworth, which at we're really excited about coming up doing it and you forgot to mention it is a ppa merit class so that's important and then another workshop in uh hanksville utah uh of course with our colorado one then with doug bennett and then uh, if they will make a screen grab of our information they can contact us for a lot of stuff there so yeah we would love to hear feedback from everybody and chris thank you everybody for listening and commenting and uh hope and staying on and paying and you know paying attention to what we have to say that was really i'm just going to read a couple of these uh, uh comments on here because they're kind of fun but uh uh from yeti saying you've got a very talented wife 10 uh the new tidbit is go do it uh jillian don't take my husband to do real photography <laughs> uh <laughs> rob black and white use in, in landscapes uh, Jamie, study the shots. Uh, let's see, Cassandra, uh, don't just go for the iconic photo. Look for something different. Uh, ben, learn that I'm on the right track, working to find out how I can get that feel that's coming through on there. Christine's going to bring a black cloth. Uh, Chris is going to see you in Leavenworth, so he'll learn more from you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so uh, lots of great things coming through. So thank you so much, everybody. That's an official wrap for our episode with Dennis. If you've learned it, write down his contact information. I'll also put it in the follow-up email that's coming to you later tonight. And uh, next week, this will be live, so uh, you can go and watch it again because you got a lot of information in there, Dennis. Thank you. Try. Like I said, RDV. <laughs> <laughs> Reader's Digest version. That's a new one for me. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.